Good morning. Welcome back. How many of you remember much from grade school? Okay. Are, are there any kind of weird lessons or just random things that you remember very specifically from when you were young? Just for some reason, that just stands out. One of those for me was um, I learned to spell the word together. I, I was first or second grade, I don't know. Is that what age kids learn to word, spell words like that? Uh, but together, I could not get it sorted. And I was at home, and I was really upset because everyone else was outside. And I was inside until I could get my spelling, whatever it was, done. And I was just frustrated. We had this old record cabinet that my dad had built in shop class when he was in school. And it was full of records that I'd never heard of, never heard the people, couldn't read some of them. But I stood over it, waiting to figure out how to spell this word. My older sister, one of the, one of the few nice things an older sister ever did for me. <laughs> she explained it to me together to get her done. I've never forgotten how to spell together to get her. It's perfect. Maybe, maybe you remember multiplication tables. I don't know how often you guys recite multiplication tables in your day-to-day -day business, but some people can just fire them off still because they learned them way back when. Maybe, maybe you learned a second language at some point, and you'll, you'll hear a word somewhere, and you remember what it was. As we begin our, our series in Timothy today, we're going to go through both of Paul's letters to Timothy that we have in the scriptures. We're going to focus on our faith and on how we get shipwrecked. Uh, how do shipwrecks happen? If you think about an actual ship wrecking in the ocean, maybe, maybe a storm. An unexpected storm comes up and they're not ready for it and they get shipwrecked. Uh, maybe they got some bad directions and they, they don't know where they're going. Maybe they ignore the good directions that they got. Or maybe they had good directions that they paid attention to. They just stopped looking what was going on. They, they got complacent. But that's how, how life is, right? We try to just kind of go about our business and we just do our daily things and we forget to pay attention where we're going and we get distracted and we find ourselves off track. We forget where we are, where we come from. We forget where we're going. And then we find ourselves shipwrecked in our faith. I'm going to say a prayer, and then we'll start with the first 11 verses of the first chapter of 1 Timothy. God, thank you so much for today. I pray you be with us as we look through Paul's letters to Timothy, and I pray that you would help us to find, find information in here that can help us in our daily lives. God, I pray that we could learn the lessons that Paul intended for Timothy, that we could learn the lessons that you intended for Paul, and that through these letters, through these lessons, we can be better followers of you. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> first Timothy, chapter 1, the first 11 verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love, from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted. This passage, this introduction to this first letter we have of Paul's to Timothy starts off with how important it is for Timothy to stick to and to teach solid doctrine. Now, now doctrine is, is just... It's our, our very core beliefs. It's how we understand the scriptures, the Bible. 
doctrine is also what has caused numerous spats, splits, arguments, fights in our churches since, since before, just before. We need solid doctrine, and that's what Paul is calling Timothy to stick to as he stays where he's at, to teach solid doctrine and stay away from those things that will cause those fights. However, we have to take that doctrine, that understanding of what God desires of us and how God wants us to live, and we have to share that with love. Did you catch that? Not with force, not with condemnation, not with fire and brimstone and beating on the pulpit so hard that you find a crack in it when you're done, not with, with a turn or burn attitude, with love. Share it with love. God commanded his disciples and us to go, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey those commands that he gave. We need to love folks while we teach them the commands that God gave us, to teach them what we were instructed so that they don't find themselves shipwrecked in their faith. We need to fulfill this mandate given from Paul to Timothy, from God to Paul, and on and on through the scriptures, we can see a very similar mandate to teach. We need to commit to God and to his word. We need to commit to solid doctrine to each other and to the world. You have been instructed. Now go and instruct. If we, if we think back and kind of mentally flip back to the, the book of Acts, we can see what happened to Paul while he was in Ephesus and why there was so much struggle there that he told Timothy to stay behind. And then after he left, he wrote a letter and said, hey, I, I instructed you to stay behind. Keep staying behind. Keep teaching solid doctrine. They, they had issues with baptism when Paul got there. So Paul explained baptism to them. And then Acts 19, 5 and 6, it says, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Paul spent months there with them, trying to teach them and instructing them, and he found them to be hardened and disobedient. After months of listening to Paul, I would love to get to sit and listen to Paul teach, but they were hardened. He pulled back a bit and spent time with a smaller group of leaders, instructing them for a couple of years. He stayed on with them. Throughout that time, God is performing miracles through Paul, and these, these people got to see these things happen. Just before he was leaving, a, a group of, of the local people got upset that he was teaching that these idols, these silver idols and these different images they had that they were worshiping weren't really gods at all. Paul was messing with people's lives by doing that. No one wanted an idol that's not really an idol, and Paul was telling them who the true God is. It was hurting people's business. They had believed this stuff forever. People made their living because people believed these things. And that seems like this ancient idea, but it's still going on today. I had the fantastic opportunity last spring to go on a trip with a former professor to some biblical sites in, in Italy and in Greece. And several of the cities, there were still these, these shops set up, these marketplaces where they had the same idols, the same images out of wood and stone that have been there, that have been being made for years. And, and I, I hadn't thought about that. For, in my mind, that was just in Bible times, people had these statues, you know, but, but it's going on today still. They have those same gods. We see statues and images in the stores and the malls. You know, we, we have our own statues and images, the dream catchers that people look to, the lucky rabbit's feet that people carry around. Maybe you have a, a coin that you carry or, or a memento that you hang on to, a logo, a brand name, something that you look to when times are hard, something you hang on to. And there's nothing wrong with hanging on to that and having fond memories, so long as that doesn't replace going to God with those issues. This is what Paul's leaving behind. This is where Paul's leaving Timothy as he goes to continue on the mission that he's been given to share the gospel with the Gentiles. This is where Timothy was with these idols, with all these things going on. And Paul instructs Timothy. He gives him a command to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Paul had stayed there for years teaching them. He knew the work wasn't done yet, but he had to go. He knew they still needed some solid 
teaching. He knew they needed doctrine. He knew the people needed to be continually taught that solid doctrine, otherwise they would get distracted. They would lose their bearing and they might get shipwrecked. So what do we have today? If, if they had Paul and he was teaching them, what do we, what do we have to learn our, our solid doctrine, to have that instruction? We have this. We have Sunday mornings. We come together, and hopefully we get some solid doctrine. We learn from the Bible every Sunday morning, whether it's through the scriptures and the message, through the songs we sing, through the communion meditation that's given. We have our, our Wednesday morning ladies group that meets we have our Thursday evening men's group that meets and studies the word. We have Sunday school class after this service. We have Wednesday evening Bible studies here at the church where we look through the scriptures. And, and you guys have an advantage that the first century people, the first century church didn't have. You have your Bible right there. How many of you have more than one Bible in your home? Not counting any digital things, you can take anywhere and get the Bible. You have those things with you. You have that advantage over the first century church. We have all the advantages we need to know solid doctrine, but we don't always take advantage of it, do we? How many of you have, have noticed your Bible sitting there and picked it up and... <sighs> have, you, have you done that? Have you done, are you, is that you? We don't always take advantage of the opportunities we have. We find a point in our lives and we get satisfied. We get complacent. We think we've got enough. We think we understand enough. Paul was at Ephesus for years and instructed Timothy to stay behind and keep teaching because they needed that continual reminder. They needed solid doctrine. We need continual reminding. We need daily to be in this word and to be looking at solid doctrine and to know what the scripture says so we can guide our lives and not get shipwrecked. Not just pure doctrine, though. That's not the only thing we need. We need a pure life as well. I want to make this note. Yes, keep instructing people. Keep teaching the solid doctrine. Keep learning the solid doctrine and passing that on. Keep using your words to teach people the truth of the gospel. Teach the whole Bible, not just the bits that you like. But do more. You, you have to have integrity of the doctrine. You have to teach with an integrity of faith. You have to have it all together, and the things that you say, you have to do. Teach people true doctrine straight from these pages, but live that doctrine as well. People are watching you. People can see when you teach them about a God-honoring, Bible-based life, and then live a self-gratifying, me-based life. You guys have been placed here where you are in life, in your communities, with your friends, with your neighbors, on purpose. And you've been instructed with what you know from God's word so that you can teach through your life and words sound biblical <laughs> doctrine. You've been instructed with God's word so you can love people with a pure heart, with good conscience, and sincere faith. You have been instructed and you have been given all that you need and probably quite a bit that you don't deserve. Now, my friends, commit to your faith and pass on that instruction. But all of that doctrine and instruction is worthless if you do it with wrong motives. If you do it selfishly, if you teach judgmentally, if you're arrogant in your faith. The next verse in our passage, verse 5, is the crux of this whole thing. The next verse not only focuses in on what Paul tells Timothy, but it reflects for us exactly what Christ did. The goal of our instruction is love. From a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It is vital that you teach sound doctrine, that you teach the Bible accurately and completely, but the goal of this teaching, the goal of this instruction is love. And I'm not talking about an all-inclusive no matter what. I'm not talking about acceptance of sin or a sinful life. I'm talking about just loving people. I'm talking about seeing folks how God would see them rather than seeing how you see their faults, rather than looking at them the way that you see their sins, especially when it comes to unbelievers. Don't, don't go to an unbeliever all judgy about their life. That's not going to help them at all. Don't start sharing the gospel, the good news, with an opening line about how they are condemned to hell if they don't listen to every word you say. You remember the verse... I had written it down, I had it here, and then Bill mentioned it, and, and, and um, 
Stan mentioned it, and it's just been going on today. That, that verse, you see it in the end zone sometimes. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. God so loved the world. Not because God condemned the world, he sent his son. For God so loved the world. That is our starting point. That is where we begin. Tell them, instruct them, teach them of God's love and what he did, how he did it, why he did it. That is the focus. That is the beginning. Do that in love. Instruct them in love. Then move on from there to lifestyle. Move on from there to the, the more, more doctrine of how they live, how they honor God, how they live a life that pleases him. How they live a life that reflects solid doctrine. Do that with love. Instruct them in doctrine, in love, and you'll be doing it the way Jesus did it. What's your motive, though? Do you share your faith? Do you tell all the people you know what the Bible says? Do you instruct them in solid doctrine because you love them and want them to receive the eternal gift that you've received? Or because you really don't like the way they live, and maybe if you would come alongside them, some of your greatness would rub off on them. Or maybe you just flat out don't approve, and you need to come and teach them how to live a proper life like you do. Maybe it's because you want to be able to tell your church friends about how many souls you saved when you get to church on Sunday, and maybe you'll beat the fellow next to you this week. Sharing your faith teaching the Bible, those are, those are things that I do for a living. But this point, this motive behind, it gets even me sometimes. This is, I mean, th I do this every day, but it's hard sometimes. Generally speaking, I do okay, I think. I, I honestly believe what I teach. I care about people. I want them to, to know Christ the way that I know him, to know the, the patience, the peace that comes when you rely on Christ. When you have that clarity in those times and you're stressed and you're freaking out and then suddenly you're like, but Jesus has me. You say a couple of Bible verses here. So I believe those things. I do okay. But occasionally, and don't tell anyone, especially the elders. <laughs> but sometimes I'm just not in the mood to take care of somebody. Sometimes I just want to sit and watch Netflix. Sometimes I'm at the grocery store and I'm running behind and I don't want to stop and say a prayer with somebody. Sometimes I'm too busy studying for my sermon to stop and listen to someone's problems. Sometimes I get so busy trying to do a good job leading that I forget to lead. That, that comes across our mind, doesn't it? When we get busy or we think about ourselves first, and then we want to step aside where no one can see us and slap ourselves around a little bit because we know that's wrong. I get distracted by myself. I get busy doing ministry, and I forget to be like Jesus. It's easy to lose our motives. It's easy to do things for the wrong reasons. Paul knew this struggle. I'm sure of it. Paul knew that Timothy would know this struggle. He knew that I would struggle with this. He knew that you guys would struggle with this. And he mentions it here in this passage, in this letter that he wrote to Timothy so long ago. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. The next thing he says is also from a good conscience. We have to live it. If you tell someone to do something, be willing to do it yourself. If you're holding others to a certain standard of life, be willing to live to that standard as well. Paul lived it. We can flip through the pages of the Bible and we can see the way he lived his life. We don't see his accumulation of things. We don't, see, we don't see how respected he was as this teacher because he stayed put and taught the things that would make people happy with him. He took the persecution because he stood by his doctrine, solid doctrine. No matter what, he stood by God and taught it to them out of love. He didn't even worry about the basics, shelter over his head, food to eat, he taught solid doctrine, and God took care of the rest. Don't we get distracted by those things pretty easily? Can't those worries shipwreck our faith? Bills, health, what the next step in life is, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next week, next month, next year, what's going to happen to our kids? Are we doing a good job raising them? Have they gone and done okay? Maybe we want someone else to live life at a certain standard, but we don't want to hold ourselves there. You know, I want you guys to feed and care for the widows and orphans, like the Bible says, but 
I'll just sit here. You guys take care of that. I want you guys to put more in the church offering plate, and I'll just keep what I have. I want you guys to stop doing this or that, but it's okay for me to continue. I want you guys to accept Christ and live a life 100% sold out for him and on fire for God and going out and evangelizing our community and our state and our world. Just don't look too closely at my life or at my motives for the things that I do. Don't dig for my secrets. That's you guys go do. Things. And that's how we look at life sometimes. We've got to practice what we preach. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Do you guys here today believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you want him to be your Lord and Savior? Do the people around you know that? If you told them that, would they believe you? People are watching. You can't just teach them good words and live the opposite. They'll notice, and it will weaken their faith. You can't simply condemn them for not being as good as you are. They'll notice, and it'll weaken their faith. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. You've been placed where you are and instructed with what you know from God's word so that you can teach through your life and through your words sound biblical doctrine. You have been instructed with God's word so you can love people with a pure heart, with a good conscience and a sincere faith, you have been instructed. You have been given all you need and much that you do not deserve. Now, my friends, commit to the faith and instruct others. That's it. Point number three today is commit. And, and point number three is doing double duty as the conclusion as well. Paul wraps up our passage for today with a word about the law. If you are righteous, if you are good, if you are really, really good not just good most of the time, you don't have to worry about messing up. But for those who are like me and can't quite reach that standard, we have to worry. We have to pay attention to the doctrine we know. The last section in our passage says the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. All these things, this list of, of lawlessness and rebellious people, it's similar to a list Paul gave back in Galatians. If you remember way back when we went through Galatians a few weeks ago, the last part of chapter 5, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you. Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These lists that Paul gives, these attributes, these activities that are contrary to sound teaching, this is what we are trying not to be. This is what we are working against in our own lives, in the lives of those we hope to instruct. We're going against immorality. We're going against the deeds of the flesh. We are working to teach sound doctrine. We're trying with everything that we are to teach sound doctrine in love, with a pure heart, with a good conscience, and a sincere faith. That is what we are committed to as followers of Christ. That is, as you read in verse 11 of our passage today, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul was entrusted with that gospel. God gave him that instruction to teach it and to live it. Paul instructed Timothy and entrusted him with the gospel and that message, that gospel, that good news has been passed down and passed down and passed down for us to hear it, to live it, and to teach it. I was instructed, you've been instructed with the gospel of Jesus, with the good news, commit yourself to it. Commit your life to it. You've been placed here where you are in your communities, with your neighbors and your friends. You've been instructed with what you know of God's word so that you can teach through your life and through your words sound biblical doctrine. You've, instructed, you've been instructed with God's word so that you can love people with a pure heart, with a good conscience and a sincere faith. 
you've been instructed and you've been given all that you need and a lot that you don't deserve. Now, my friends, commit to the faith and go and instruct others with sound doctrine. I'm going to say a closing prayer and we're going to sing another song together. And if you need prayer now, come forward and let's pray. Look to the person next to you and say a prayer. Sit back down and pray together. If you've never committed your life to Christ, now is a good time to do that. Come talk to me. If you don't have a church home and you've been coming here and you want to be accountable to this congregation and you want to hold this congregation accountable so we can be the church that God intends us to be, now's a good time to come and let us know that you're committed to this church, that you want this to be your church home, and they're here to make sure that we stick to sound doctrine, and you're here so we can make sure you stick to sound doctrine. Now is a good time to do that. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for the scriptures we have. I thank you for the doctrine that we can learn. God, I pray that we would be committed to your word, God. I pray that we would study it, that we would follow it, and we wouldn't let our faith get shipwrecked. God, I thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen.